Hey everyone, welcome to the Other Canada Podcast. I am your host, Owen Osinde. I'm joined by Isaac Olawalafe, the founder and president of Dream Maker. You're in for a treat for this episode. We're talking everything from venture capital, real estate, Isaac's beginnings, and you know what's made him such a success so far, and so many other gems that he drops on this episode that talks about the things that you can do today to really begin your journey into the business world or in the real estate world. And also we want to shout out BDC for sponsoring this episode. We could not have done it without them. We're in for a treat. So stay tuned and uh, listen all the way to the end. And make sure to like and subscribe on this episode as well too. Leave us a review. You know, we put in all this hard work. Let us know what you think of the episode at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back here for the other Canada podcast, and uh, we're joined by Isaac Olawalafe, founder of Dream Maker. You know, your company is doing amazing things um, in the community. Uh, you're in different subsidiaries, property management, education, private equity, uh, brokerage, wealth management. I can go on. And, um, you know, really before getting into Dream Maker, we want to learn more about you. Like your upbringing, your the early days, like what makes Isaac Olawalafe the man who he is today? And we can't get there if we don't go back to the origins. So like, where did you grow up? Absolutely. Well, thanks uh, for the invite. Um, so I was originally born in Nigeria. I mm-hmm. uh, came here when I was four. Yeah. Um, grew up in Toronto, Jane and Finch area. Um, and then my parents, uh, in around when I was about 16 years old, 15, 16, we moved from Toronto to Woodbridge. Yes. And again, that was a you know, cultural shift, environmental shift. And really the main purpose at that time was because I was playing soccer. So my elementary coach convinced my parents, you know, move move your, your son and move their family as a whole to, to Woodbridge, get a chance to get scouted. You know, didn't end up getting scouted, um, but through playing soccer, built a lot of uh, relationships, yeah. um, which has helped shape the different places and spaces that I'm in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and while at um, in Woodbridge at Holy Cross Academy, uh, played soccer, rugby, all different types of sports, but always education was very important, especially yeah. for my parents. Our Nigerian household, like education is paramount, you know, like, I mean, I'm from <laughs> I'm Kenya. The <laughs> exactly. So you got to set the, you got to set the standard. Like you're setting the precedent for a, like nothing, like, you can't get nothing lower than like a 90 or whatever. Correct. It's just like crazy, crazy how, our parents think, but yeah, I totally get the vibes where you're coming from. Yeah, so that's that was a sort of focus. So really, there was a lot of multitasking at that age. You know, when I was, you know, I was doing extra activities, playing sports, you know, advanced classes, and really trying to get into university. And, yes, you know, fortunate to get into U of T. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, the focus was computer science. Yep. Uh, which after the first year, switched it to economics. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you're playing soccer at the time, what was your ambition with the game? Really, my ambition was actually to to play for either Canada or Nigeria. Once I got mm-hmm. older, really, I was I was playing sweeper defense. You know, our the, the team that I was playing on on the rep side, we mm-hmm. we did fairly well. We were top three um, in the region, and then on the school, we were top three in in the province as well too. So, mm-hmm. you know, we were, I was playing on some good teams, and it's funny to to be watching, you know, Canada play right now in the yes. World Cup, and some of the players. I think few players. Played the same year when I was playing, so it's really good to see the growth in sports. Yeah, yeah the Canada, you know, we're, we're known as a, a hockey nation. Yeah. So to see us, I mean, I knew we're not going to go far, but just as a milestone from where we were at oh, yeah. to, like, how the game is growing is beautiful. And I'm curious, like, what's uh, your favorite Premier League team? Premier League team? Ugh. So and mostly at that time was watching more series, Serie A. Um, Serie A. Yeah, Serie A. So, you know, Inter... Uh, Juventus, yeah. you know, um, back then. But, you know, and then the other team was Barcelona. I liked a lot of the Brazil players. Mm-hmm. Roberto Carlos was one of my favorite players yeah. and on the defense side, you know, on the striker side, Ronaldo. So, you know, a little bit of different teams. The legends. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The legends, man. I feel you, man. I love my favorite team is Liverpool. Ah. I've been with them, like, even when they're crappy. Like, I remember when Gerard slipped. That was such a devastating moment just because – it was right there and then there. No. And, um, but, you know, we came back. We won the premiership uh, <laughs> a couple of years back. And it's funny because I'm also a diehard Raptors fan, too. Mm-hmm. 
So the same year we win the the championship in the NBA, we also win the Premier League title. I just uh. felt like like something like God was looking <laughs> out for me that day. So um, what a blessing that year was. So going back, you know, you go to UFT, switch from comp side to econ. Yeah. What made the switch? Really, at that time, was a, you know, computer science, you know, I, I loved computers. Mm-hmm. So it's funny, full circle, how, you know, now we're dabbling onto tech. But, you know, I love computers, but I didn't know how to program it. You know, right out of the gates and first year at University of Computer Science, you had to program a lot. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, growing up in Woodbridge, seeing my dad and my mom, who were also in real estate and in business, I felt economics really gave me sort of that overall fundamentals. Uh, when it comes to business, so that's why I switched over just to get the core fundamentals on on um, on business yes. and see how I could eventually use that in the in the future when I actually launch a business. Yeah. So you do four years at UFT, graduate with an econ degree. Uh, what was your favorite memory while being in uni? Favorite memory, I think, really just the network and the relationships. Yeah. You know, I think the the biggest thing, and and if I had to do it again, you know, it build more key relationships. You know. Mm-hmm. And it's always being around diverse um, communities, diverse students, becoming international students, Absolutely. Um, local students, so really getting different perspective. I think that was definitely the best um, you know, time in the, at, at university. And, and there was a few professors that really challenged me. You know, similar to high school, there's professors that challenged, challenged me and allowed me to sort of go beyond uh, my, my limits it's from, from the thought process and the problem solving. And I, that's what's helped in a lot of the challenges that we like to jump into to try and fix. Oh, absolutely. So I know that um, right when you're, um, when you're in university, you're also getting into property at the time, right? Yeah. And one of your goals was to buy property while in school. Right. Did you make this happen? Made it happen. You know, I was fortunate. You know, at 21, got my first property, and, and that's around the same time when I started the company Dream Maker. Yeah. And, you know, I remember... You know, 21, 22, really, again, back to the multitasking, you know, working midnight shift at UPS, taking the tuition reimbursement to buy the first property and, and start up the first company. Um, and then during the day, studying the real estate courses so I could eventually become a real estate agent and real estate broker while finishing up um, economics classes. Mm-hmm. So, so, so a lot going on during those uh, times. You know, I'm curious, you know, like you are doing it all while in school. Like, where did that burning desire and ambition for wanting more come from at that early age as a 21-year-old? Yeah. It's very uncommon. Well, I think it was just a drive of seeing the sacrifice my parents made, you know, coming here and moving us from Toronto to Woodbridge, mm-hmm. you know, sacrificing to buy a home, to put us in a, in a better environment, to get more opportunities. So I felt I, you know, I couldn't, mm-hmm. I couldn't waste that opportunity. I really, you yeah. know, as God opened up more opportunities and more relationships, more doors, um, I want to take full advantage of it, right? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't take any opportunity as uh, for granted. Mm-hmm. I, and I said, let me maximize on each opportunity. Let me yeah. learn from each opportunity and let me try and scale each opportunity given. Mm-hmm. And did you have a specific type of property you wanted to purchase um, to, as a, like, was it an investment or did you want to live in it? What was your mindset at that point? No, it was strictly investment because uh, you know, I wasn't moving out until I got married. So yes. it, was, it was strictly investment uh, to rent out. Um, and really the key was just to get in the game. Mm-hmm. You know, get in the game. So the faster I could get in the game is the faster I could learn the game. The faster I could fail forward. The faster I could help others. Um, so the faster I could test it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we've been able to do um, ever since. You know, yes. test every different type of um, area within the real estate mm-hmm. space. Yeah. And for context, right? Because I know real estate prices change a lot. Yes. <laughs> uh, what year was this that you made this uh, purchase? <sighs> well, the property at Kipling and Steels was at you know one nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, front in Spadina was one forty nine mm-hmm. uh, for a one bedroom. Remember, Malvern was one twenty nine. Mm-hmm. You know, and then prices started to creep up when they're at two fifty mm-hmm. for a one plus den. Remember Liberty Village starting at one ninety nine yep. for two story. Yep. So the things have changed drastically mm-hmm. since then. And what year was this? This would have been about I want to say seventeen now, seventeen 17. years ago. Seventeen years ago. <laughs> yeah. So that's like we're looking at uh, two thousand fifteen, two thousand five, two thousand six ish yeah. around there. Yeah. I was like in grade six at the time. I didn't even know what property <laughs> is. You know, my parents just actually bought a house in Sarnia. We actually did like a whole new. Uh, 
build back there. And um, yeah, I was a young guy at the time. And you're, here you are making moves. Every try, day. man. Try. <laughs> All right. So I know you went into, you, you, you're going into real estate. Yep. Then you become an agent. One of the top performing agents, um, especially for like new builds, right? Yeah. Walk us through that career path and like how did it impact you starting like actually elevating Dream Maker to the next level? Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, when we first got in, it was mostly resale um, property. Then I remember I bought my first property that was one year old. Mm-hmm. And when I saw the price and I saw what the individual paid three years ago, mm-hmm. it was about $80,000 more. So I'm like, this is weird. Mm-hmm. And then, so that's when I started to research pre-construction. Yes. Um, and then I started to tell a lot of individuals within my, my close network at the time and even friends and family that, look, pre-construction is the way to go. Toronto is on track the next 10 plus years to be the next New York. Um, but as New York continues to scale, Toronto will continue to scale as well too, right? So we saw the fundamental growth, immigration, infrastructure, investments from private sector and public sector, education. Mm-hmm. And so we felt there was going to be a, a big boom happening in the pre-construction space. And it's funny, the first few pre-construction, we would come there just as a broker, um, as an agent after it's launched and We'll get access to a few units, you know, for 250000 And then I went to some of the developers after and said, you know, I noticed that there's a few spots already taken, a few units already taken. They're like, yeah, you know, agents were here the night before or two nights before and were first in line and got it. So I said, okay, well, we got to increase our, our grind and our hustle. So for the next, I think, eight or nine projects, we were first in line. Sometimes we would wait five days before the launch, four days before the launch. You know, there was one time at Fun and Spadina, we were there about three, four nights. There had to be over 100 people that came after the fact. You know, the cops came after the fact because there's a lot of people hungry to buy pre-construction real estate right when the boom was about to happen, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, a lot of developers saw, you know, what we were doing. We were, you know, one of the few out of our community there buying bulk units, and especially at that age as well, too. So, yeah. so that opened up doors from developers saying that, okay, you know what, let's, let's talk before we even launch mm-hmm. and see if you want allocation. So that's when we start to build, build our name for on the pre-construction side mm-hmm. um, and probably transacted thousands of units mm-hmm. uh, with hundreds of individuals, um, helping a lot of individuals become millionaires, really. Mm-hmm. So from what I'm hearing is, you were getting the inside scoop on the units and you would have them under the dream maker name, not the Isaac name. Correct. And then you'd flip them over to people looking to buy them. Correct. That's amazing, yeah. man. And how many units did you sell? Well, like I said, we were doing thousands. Thousands yeah, of units. We were doing eh? thousands of units. And I really, our company was like, you know, we're called dream maker. And, and because we were di- giving them one for one allocation. Mm-hmm. So we didn't, we didn't actually flip to any of our friends and family. They were getting the same direct access that we were getting and, and through that a lot of people changed careers, changed their lives, changed their friends' friends' lives. Mm-hmm. And it really if you if you look at the web that it created in the GTA is probably, you know, tens of thousands that yeah. that benefited from what we were doing almost fifteen years ago. Okay. So shifting from being an agent to fully going into Dream Maker, what was that process like? Yeah, so after we did about forty plus developments that we were selling the GTA I noticed that to really create wealth, especially for the community, we need to be part of the supply chain. Exactly. We need to be part of building the infrastructure. So that's when we launched Dream Maker Developments. And you know, I was about at that time I would have been about, you know, twenty eight years old. And I said, you know, let's jump into the development space. But if we're gonna do it, let's do it where we mitigate the risk. Mm-hmm. So to mitigate the risk, look for a fundamentally sound location. So at that time we chose a location right across of Yorkdale Mall. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a top premier mall in Canada, one of the largest luxury malls in North America. And we saw a few fundamental things happening around that time. Mm-hmm. Um, about, you know, five minute drive mm-hmm. from it, they were building the first digital hospital right at mm-hmm. 401 in Kiel. Mm-hmm. The public sector um, announced the expansion of the subway right up to York University. The private sector announced the expansion of Yorkdale Mall to include all the designer stores that we see there now. So we were fortunate to buy land directly across of it, 0.7 of an acre. 
And we, we built a boutique building, nine stories, 83 units, commercial on the bottom, and four townhouses. Mm-hmm. And when you say we a lot, who's we? <laughs> so it was at that time, you know, my obviously my dad played a key a key yes. role, um, especially on the on the brokerage side. Mm-hmm. And then close investors um, that were on board. Um, and then those that were able to bring in on the development side, on the construction side, mm-hmm. uh, with, you know, you know, by God's grace, just really organizing and, and putting everyone on track mm-hmm. and able to from start to finish um, buy the site, develop it, build it within four and a half years. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that's where our office is on the bottom. And ever since then, have you built any other buildings like within like the downtown core? So we not buildings, but since then we've built uh, 23 towns in Durham, a boutique hotel, which we'll talk about by the airport, a bunch of custom homes in in Kleinberg, York Region, mm-hmm. um, luxury townhouses at Bayview and York Mills. Yep. Um, and right now we have about eight more projects um, in the pipeline, uh, 67 townhouses right outside the city, yep. 18 towns in Collingwood, mm-hmm. Bradford, and then a boutique hotel in Rotsonville. Yes. Yeah, so we're... We're busy on the development side. I can tell, man. Yeah. You guys are busy earning. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, key thing you mentioned is uh, generational wealth, yeah. right? And which really seems led you into going to the development side. Correct. And in our community, we always talk about generational wealth, generational wealth. It's like becoming a buzzword now. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know where to start. And defining general, generational wealth is... You know, it can be arbitrary. Mm-hmm. When you're looking at generational wealth, how many years or let's say decades make generational wealth? You know, a generational wealth is not only just capital, mm-hmm. money. It's, it's also uh, creating infrastructure for access mm-hmm. um, to higher education, mm-hmm. um, access to higher opportunities, yes. access to higher um, profitability from investments. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what, like, and that's access to creating your own destiny. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's why for us, infrastructure was key Um, and through infrastructure, creating more access to opportunities. And by creating more access to opportunity, you allow for those to be able to tap into that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not not necessary just for yourself. If it's just for yourself, you get a nice high paying job Mm -hmm. and you're getting riches. You know, wealth is created through multiple streams. It's great. And it impacts multiple individuals. Yeah. Right. Because it's wealth. It's just a larger, larger sum. And it takes time Mm -hmm. to build it. Like for us, we've been in the development game for about 10 years. And we developed and built over a quarter billion dollars worth of real estate, um, all in the core areas of the GTA, because we want to make sure that it's exposable. We want to make sure that it's able to motivate those within our community. Um, and also it's harder to play in a space like Toronto and, and we love challenges and we, we've been able to overcome those challenges. And now we're like, okay, now we can go outside the GTA and then go outside even the province as well too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but through, through real estate, you know, it's allowed to open up other doors, which we've now started using as a form of wealth creation. Yeah. And you know, one of those aspects to actually expediting the process to wealth creation is tech. Yes. You know, you've been really into investing into tech, <clears throat> involving yourself in the tech community here in Toronto, um, and putting DreamMaker as like one of like the leaders in investing in tech companies um, within the tech space in Toronto and Canada, and also like other ventures which are coming in. What intrigued you about tech uh, in the beginning? Yeah, no, again, it was sort of by accident through the the work we're doing on our foundation, you know, you know, one of the key areas that we always talk about is institutional relationships. You know, when we started our first endowment almost 15, 16 years ago at UFT for African studies, you know, that was a form of building institutional relationship and creating something that's generational. Mm-hmm. Um, again, that's access to education for those um, from the African diaspora um, looking to take to go to U of T, right? Yeah. That's that's generational. Um, in a sense, that's generational wealth um, in, a, in a form as well, too. And that was 16 years ago. Mm. And then about eight years ago, we, we did a, a gift to, the, to Ryerson at that time, um, the Student Learning Center. And when we gave that gift, it was focused on technology. So this was the first sort of um, bookless library, it was yeah. a digital library, um, Student Learning Center, right beside right beside the, the, the older library. Mm-hmm. And when we did that room, it was called the Isaac Olafe Digital Media Lab. Mm-hmm. 
And the premise was a room that gave access to technology, 3D printers, 3D glasses for Ryerson students and stu students outside of the university. Mm -hmm. So that was my first exposure to, um, to technology mm -hmm. uh, from that aspect. And, and then I remember a few companies that were within what was the DMZ, which would have been only about three, four years in, um, you know, reached out and said, Isaac, you know, I have, I have a tech company and we're looking to fundraise, you know, can you do an investment? Um, and at that time, you know, full focus was real estate. Um, but I'm always intrigued at learning new things um, and new challenges and, and overcoming them. And that's when I did some research on the tech space and invested in it. And, and that's when Dreammaker Ventures was, was born. And, born yeah. and then we started to do, you know, strategic, fundamentally sound investment in tech. Yeah, because I, you know, I, I remember at that time I was wrapping on my last year at Ryerson and your name was bouncing around a lot. Uh, you were giving speeches mm -hmm. like you were like your your presence was big in Ryerson and now dream maker ventures appears then the pandemic happens right. right just a series of events just continue happening and happening then once that happened that was around the time a uh, black innovation fund started emerging right. Right. so how do you go from talking about forming dream maker ventures yeah. And even before going to Biff, did you make an investment into any of those companies that reached out to you? Oh yeah, yeah. So through Dreammaker Ventures, we did probably thirty plus investments into um, some tech companies. Some of the more notable ones, um, Second Closet, which is now called Bolt or mm -hmm. or even Hopper. Um, but but really, at that time, again, seven eight years ago, when I was going to all these different events, you know, whether it be in Communitech or Mars or 111, mm -hmm. you know, I was noticing, again, a lack of diversity. And then that's when we went back to the university, um, which we knew already established a great incubator mm. uh, called DMZ and said, you know, let's, let's create more space um, within the current incubator for black founders. Mm -hmm. um, and that gave birth to the Black Innovation Fellowship. Um, and to make sure that it was mainstream is when we brought on um, the tech giant, um, Shopify. We brought on an institution, BMO. Yeah. And then we brought on a foundation, mm -hmm. uh, the Women's Foundation, um, because 50% of the seats that we were creating, we wanted to be female-led founders as well from the black community. So that was something that was historical. It was never done in any Canadian university. Mm -hmm. And through that, the first goal was just to impact 10 founders every year for five years. And then there's no need for it. Because it'll just become a way of life. Yes. And and especially in a major city like Toronto, you go into any incubator, you see diversity. Yeah. So it's not like something that we wanted it to to continue. We just wanted to create the opportunity, establish the opportunity, make it mainstream. Mm -hmm. Then it's not something that needs to be talked about because mm -hmm. it's just normal it's now. Just normal now. Normalized it. Like investing in a black founder, it's like the way you normalize investing into like a white founder or like Correct. whatever. Or a woman on boards. Woman on right? boards, it's, yeah. It's not need to be talked about once it, once it becomes normalized. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's that was our main goal. And I think we did that. And again, obviously, as you mentioned, the pandemic hit. But even prior to that, we wanted to create a diversity fund. Yes. Because we felt there's no point creating the fund without having the, the, the foundation and the infrastructure mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you can't invest in companies if you can't put around the wraparound services yep. to be able to allow them to scale, mm -hmm. to get them access for collaboration with other VC funds, for, um, collaboration with um, access to companies that could use their services. Mm -hmm. Right? If they're not within that space, how would they get access to it? So that's what Black Innovation Fellowship did. It created access in an industry that the black community was in, plugged into, right? So we, we came into that industry. We saw the demand of that industry. Mm -hmm. We saw the industry change in with tech. And tech, as Robert Smith always says, cuts across all industries, Yes. right? So we felt that the black community misses out on tech. Like It's going to be a big problem in the next five to ten years. And we saw that during COVID, mm -hmm. right? We saw the impact of technology across all our lives. Yeah. Health tech, ed tech, you know, logistics, you know, the restaurant industry, right? So with Uber Eats and Skip Digital, so we saw every business, every way of life was impacted by tech. Mm -hmm. AI, 
right? All these different things, activities, where our lives are impacted by tech that we're not participating in from an investor point of view, from an employee point of view, and definitely from a founder point of view. Mm-hmm. So we were trying to change that. Yeah. And when you look into it, why do you think, why do you believe our community has such a low participation in tech? Well, I think it doesn't have a low participation in tech. It has a low participation in mainstream tech. Mainstream tech. Right, because when we launched Black Innovation Fellowship, hundreds of founders raised their hands Mm -hmm. because now they're being talked to. Mm. Right, when we launched the Black Innovation Fund, which is now BKR Capital, we've seen 600 plus founders reach out to us. Mm. Right, so there have always been black tech founders out there. There's always been individuals from the black community in tech, but there hasn't been that many spaces inviting them yes right so once those spaces were created once that access was created once representation was there mm-hmm. as a black founder looking across and say okay you know what that's a vc fund that understands me right that's uh it's just like diversity in general mm-hmm. like if you you know whether you're a founder of woman or from different background if you don't see yourself across the board you're going to just keep your head down and just focus on your business absolutely but the second you look across and say okay you know what I think that person could understand the business I'm trying to create. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's all about, it's it's all about uh, switching the idea of what we see a tech founder to be. When you say a tech founder, you usually think they went to Stanford, they're white male, uh, let's say they're Stanford, like Ivy League, and they're in the Valley. This this is who VC show called Silicon Valley right? exactly right, and they're wearing like a like a Patagonia vest, <laughs> like a little hoodie, um, like they're kind of dorky, but yeah, like they get the lingo, and I think this is what's intimidating for uh, people, like especially like for Black tech founders and my and women as well too, is the image of what we see a tech founder needs to be transformed. Yeah. And the success stories of what we see tech founders, okay, we think of the Zuckerbergs, we think of Evan Spiegel of Snapchat or Brian Chesky, Airbnb, or Travis Kalanick, Uber. PayPal Mafia. PayPal Mafia. They all yeah. came back all to- All the individuals that's ex- part of PayPal Mafia. Exactly, right? And they all, Elon Musk. There needs to be a different image of how we see ourselves and how we really infiltrate the space. And that's something that I think is slowly start, starting right. to transform. Oh, yeah. And we're noticing even more black women start majority of these tech firms, which is amazing. amazing yeah. You know what I mean? And one of the things I, I was reading about um, was even though black women are getting a lot of funding, they're usually just getting seed funding. But to go from seed to series A, there is this one article on Crunchbase, which is saying it's the valley of death. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're seeing everybody. Oh, yeah, we can seed you. Right. But to allow you to grow now which you can become unicorn status is where like the there's like a lot of friction there like and that that's where you need infrastructure Mm -hmm. right to to, for something to last you need to build the right infrastructure Mm -hmm. and then do and then start plugging plane yeah right so if you can't just create something and then put out some capital it's just you know a bandage mm-hmm. it's not going to be sustainable yeah you got to create the infrastructure and use a sports analogy mm-hmm. because you know we were the first um, black organization as a jersey sponsor of Canada basketball and the reason why we did that is because we loved the infrastructure they were creating for basketball in Canada and now you see Canada on the international level mm-hmm. how much better they're doing because they create that infrastructure from seeing that youth right in there in elementary school and prepping them to get into the NBA. Mm-hmm. What are the steps that are required? It's no different from a tech founder. What are the incubators that are out there? What are the wraparound services that are out there? What are the loan programs? What are the grant programs? What are the events? What are the different corporations that could sponsor them or that could open up doors for them? Mm-hmm. And then what is the seed capital? What is the series A capital? What is the bridge capital? You know, what's the credit capital? And then what's the series B? And then where's the private equity that wants to, you know, maybe do a big stake in them to have them go public or continue the series C, series D? Mm. That's a whole infrastructure. Yeah. Like, so we're still very early in that. Still very early. And, you know, it can cause a lot of frustration in people because, yes, <clears throat> doors are opening for us. Yeah. Yes, people are getting. But it's all about having that patience to, like, really see it out. And I love the sports analogy. And 
I love the the Raptors and, and <laughs> what Masai's built. Like yep. from if you look at who we were twelve years ago, right. we didn't have a G, uh, a G League team. Yep. We didn't have a practice facility. Right. We didn't have all these different things that we can bring these players in. Exactly. And now look at the Van Vliet, the Siakams. Now right. they're all stars. They're NBA yep. champions, and that's kind of how I see how tech is moving. Correct. Right. Black men and women and minorities is these things we're doing now are going to pay dividends 20, 25 right. years exactly. from now. We might not be the ones who get the benefits of it, mm-hmm. but I think for the larger part of the community is what's going to actually be the ones where, hey, in 2040, we're going to be out here being like a major player and Correct. be seen as like yeah. um, people who actually start good businesses. So BKR Capital, why did you change the name of your firm to BKR Capital? Well, again, so we, we, you know, when we had the Black Innovation Fellowship um, and then we launched the Black Innovation Fund, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't any um, miscommunication in terms of the, the name. Mm-hmm. And then also we wanted to make sure that it's not about just having <clears throat> an organization called, you know, starting with Black, that, that this is the first institutional fund in Canada mm-hmm. that happened to have, you know, a Black general partner, and myself, a black yeah. managing partner in Liz mm-hmm. that are focusing on investing in black led founders. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's mm-hmm. why we decided to change, um, change their name. Um, and, and really it comes back to the history of, you know, the acronym um, BKR is tied to the Musa, uh, Musa family from centuries ago. Right. And, and legends. really legends and, and the story yes. right around those legends was around innovation was around, you know, taking technology back then and going out and going and looking for new lands, looking for new opportunities. Yeah. And with BKR, that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. We're investing in innovators. We're investing in those that are able to take calculated risk. Mm-hmm. Those that are able to go out into a new space. Those that are trying to change um, the way things are happening in one industry or the other. Um, so that's why we we changed the name to to be it's here. Lack of com- you don't want a confusion to right. happen again. Um, <clears throat> as one of the prominent firms investing in Black entrepreneurs, uh, you have all these people coming to you asking for an investment, and you know I can imagine them being as you know what this is my opportunity to get this. How hard is it turning certain founders down, and you know how do you help them get that? money they're looking for but maybe not from you but to someone else yeah no i think it is it's very hard but i think it's really just setting expectations and that's why you know having a fund on its own is not enough because mm-hmm. um, if you look at outside our community there's multiple funds yeah you know there's multiple um, seed funds series a funds and and larger larger funds angel funds so i think the the key for us is again having them know if maybe you're not getting invested by BKR because we could only invest in 18 companies, but tap into the infrastructure that's within BKR, mm-hmm. within Dream Legacy, and within Dream Maker as a whole. Mm-hmm. So that maybe we're not invested in you, but we're connecting the dot to another fund mm-hmm. that could invest in you. Maybe you're not getting any capital from us, but maybe right now you could get a loan, yep. right? Maybe we could just open the door and get you a big contract. Right. So that's part of the environment and the ecosystem that we're also helping to champion um, because capital is one thing, but relationship networks is also as valuable. Yeah. And that's one of the things, too, like when we're looking at over the past couple of years, a lot of these incumbents do want to support black businesses, do want to support black entrepreneurs. But within the community, there's this thing going around where it's cool to invest in black entrepreneurs. But do they really care, right? And we can see with the BMOs, with the Shopify's, and I can't say they don't care because they did put their money Correct. down. Um, you're seeing it with uh, this chatter was going on with Black North, what, with what West Hall is doing. Correct. What are your thoughts on that? Like, do you feel like it's cool to invest in Black entrepreneurs, or do these organizations truly care of really elevating the Black community? I think I think all the organizations care, and that's why they've created. Yeah. Um, a platform and an opportunity to be able to come in with your ideas where you could collaborate with them, um, leverage the infrastructure that they've been building for, you know, for decades and centuries so that you could scale and make an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, institutions that aren't from the community could only do so much. Yeah. 
it takes, you know, individuals, organizations within the community collaborating with institutions and say, look, this is the, the leverage that you have. This is the infrastructure you have. This is the know-how we we have, and this is what we want to bring to the table. This is what you could bring to the table, and this is the impact we can make with it. Yeah. <clears throat> Ryerson was already doing a great job when it comes to incubator. Yeah. And they're already, they're a diversity university. Mm -hmm. um, but we brought to the table and said, you know what, let us help you in an area that, that we have um, a better expertise in, mm -hmm. right, which is exposure to black founders. Yeah. Um, and, but you have a better expertise in incubator because you've been doing such a great job. Mm -hmm. Let's collaborate and scale, right? So I think if we do more of those, we'll see more impact with institutions. And it wouldn't be a question of whether they care enough. It's just, you know, we, we you're, it's collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. Like, I think we've moved, <coughs> our community has moved away from being, um, of utilizing an institution to collaborating mm -hmm. with an institution. And you see it with all the different announcements, whether it's on the healthcare side, you know, um, sitting on the board of Sick Kids, you know, launching the fellowship for Sickle Cell, that shifted the black community from utilizing that hospital um, to now collaborating in that hospital with a cause that impacts the black community. Mm -hmm. A year later, BOF in collaboration with Walmart, I think, um, expanded on the Sickle Cell um, initiative, mm -hmm. right? So again, that's, now we're, we're getting more collaboration in our community with institutions than just utilizing the institution. Yeah. And I think we also got to move from that utilization and actually collaborate and partner, yeah. right? It's kind of like the endorsement or do you want to be an owner in actually having stock in the person right. who's like investing and in giving you a shoe deal or something like that. Right. right. And, and you hear this with a lot of like pitches too. Uh, there's like one story with, you know, Tristan Walker. Mm. Um, there's like this idea when you're pitching a VC, they don't understand your issues. So for example, like, you know, individuals like you and I, when we shave, sure. it's like a coarse curly hair problem, yeah. but you're pitching to like a white VC. They have no idea yeah, no, how yeah. to, like when you're talking about them, there's like this one story he's giving, he says, <laughs> this is impacting a lot of black men. They get razor bumps and they need this shaving system. The VC tells him, you know, why don't you focus on making like an acne system? <laughs> and Tristan's just like, I'm pitching you a product that's actually serving a community and you're not there. And this comes to the collaboration right. part. We need more of us in these spaces. Yeah, and representation. Representation, because if we can't have someone there representing us, how is it going to be? It's going to be a difficult path towards actually getting something collaborative right. if someone in there doesn't say, hey, you know what? I trust this person right. and what they're saying. I am from his group community and this, we should definitely look into this. Right. Imagine how many millions they've missed out on because they just don't have that ability to really turn off their, yeah, like that doesn't impact the majority of right. people. It's crazy. That's what happens when you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you don't right? know. So yeah. that's, and that, that's, that's a common, that's a common situation. And that's why there's been, a lot of studies. Mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs has put out a lot of studies on the impact of diversity. Yeah, um, the, you, you get more perspective. You get more understanding of a larger market. <clears throat> and indirectly, you're mitigating your risk and you're, you're growing your profitability. Yeah. And that's, that's diversity and that's representation. Yeah. And some firms, they ignore the diversity thing. There was like this one quote, this one lady, um, I think it's TechCrunch, but <laughs> she, they're saying... Oh, why don't you have more diversity? It's like, you know what? We value diversity of thought. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is what is diversity of thought, right? You can't have diversity of thought if the person who is thinking you guys come from the same Correct. Uh, standing point and et cetera. So I, I just think it's hilarious how they try and circumvent from the situation to make it say, yeah, diversity of thought is what matters the most, which is kind of crazy. Uh, when you look at your uh, firm, you know, BKR, uh, out of all the investments, like which organizations have been your biggest winners? Well, we've only been, we only closed our fund even just earlier this year. Um, we've done about seven investments, um, some very exciting um, companies that we've invested into. Um, a company out in PEI, um, Jonah is the CEO, um, called um, MIQ. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of, you know, a company out in PEI, there's already 
low investments being made um, in in tech in that region. Um, never mind to black led funds, uh, black led companies. We invested in that company last year. Uh, we gave them exposure to Toronto and to more mainstream VCs. Um, and just recently, they they raised at a higher valuation uh, from Relay Venture. You know, so they're in the fintech company. Uh, we're really excited about the work that they're doing. Another company that we're invested into is called Loft. Um, they're based out here in Toronto, and and they're trying to create um, collaborative um, workspaces um, to help corporations um, return employees back to work. Um, they just landed a multi million dollar multi-year partnership with the federal government uh, to help federal workers um, come back to work. Um, so that's in a prop tech space. Um, you know, we just recently um, invested in uh, Claudette's cybersecurity company. Um, obviously, cybersecurity is a big industry. Yeah. So we're definitely excited about um, about that one as well, too. Um, and then we're right now looking at ones in the, in the healthcare space, um, in, the, in the logistics space. Um, so again, the hard, the hardest thing right now is that we're seeing a lot of great deal flow, um, and we're really just trying to get, do our due diligence with all of them. And again, if we can't invest, see where else we could help them, see who else we could connect them with, whether it's an incubator, whether it's another fund um, that's uh, within the, um, the tech ecosystem, or um, just even companies that are looking for their services. Got you. Uh, for those entrepreneurs who will be listening to this podcast, at what point is it the best time for them to approach BKR for funding? I think once obviously they've launched their company um, and they've started to get some traction um, and they're, you know, they're looking to, cause our check size is anywhere between 50,000 to half a million dollars. And then we like to do follow on investments. Um, so we typically ask um, um, founders to see, okay, if you're trying to raise, you know, half a million dollars, seven fifty, have you already circled with other, um, with other funds, um, and then see how we could help you with that. Um, and then, and then starting that due diligence process, which could be anywhere from 30 days to about 90 days, um, where we'll either help in leading the round, um, or coming in with the uh, other than uh, other funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are you only investing in tech companies? Correct. Yeah. So right now, our focus is strictly strictly tech companies. Strictly tech, yeah. Okay. yeah, from pre C to seed plus. Mm. What about uh, you know just to have some pushback here? Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, what about those organizations that are killing it, but they not they might be strictly e commerce? What do you what do you say about that? Again, it all it all really depends. So I'll give you a perfect example in, uh, in Montreal. Um, Goody, mm -hmm. um, great company. Um, two brothers. Um, they're in the e commerce space. Um, environmental, uh, um, uh, social impact products that they're selling um, online. Um, they've been uh, invested by BDC, EDC. Uh, we've invested um, in them, um, and they've been around for a few years now, so they're doing very well in the e-commerce space. So that's, that's an example of, uh, again, a tech, tech uh, company we've invested into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then with the tech space, right, <clears throat> you mentioned that there are – a lot of black entrepreneurs who are starting tech companies. Um, what do you think about parents who are actually raising kids to really start getting them to think about, hey, you know what, you can be a tech entrepreneur. You should start thinking about tech. Because I think culturally, mm -hmm. tech has been something that hasn't been really been spoken about. Usually when we think of success in our community, it either has to be something in entertainment, mm -hmm. athletics, uh, so shifting that culture, and I know you have three daughters yes. too, right? What are you doing in your home to really get them to think of wealth, tech, and all that stuff just to get them ready to really flourish in the, in the business space? I think bringing them to environments where they could see themselves, right? And, and I think that's why it's so critical to, to create more infrastructure, create more um, programs that are involved in entrepreneurship, that are involved in tech, that are being led by those from the community. Yes. So that when the youth go to them, they could see themselves. They could see, oh, okay, this is, you know, um, an instructor that's from the community that's talking about tech, that's talking about STEM. Mm -hmm. You know, now when you look at the TV, you, you see an individual like Wes Hall that's in Dragon's Den that's invested in businesses in general. Um, you know, if you're now going to the Black Innovation Fellowship, 
you you learn about a program that is for black tech founders, mm-hmm. right? So I think, you know, is again is representation and environment that needs to be continued to be created, that's mainstream, that youth could get exposure to, that young adults could get exposure to and feel comfortable in those environments and be able to learn new things mm-hmm. in those environments. Yeah, and also just changing our belief system of what we can do. Correct. And believing that we can win and believing that we do deserve to be in those spaces and we exactly. can make a contribution. Um, you know, those are the conversations I'm having with my friends. I'm like, listen, guys, you know, when we have our families over the next like five, 10 years, we might not be reaping the benefits of the success, but mm-hmm. it's on our shoulders to really like carry this forward that, right. hey, s- try STEM, right. you know? Go into this, learn, be the builders, because these are the people who are going to be shifting uh, the culture forward and what success looks like. So no one aspires just to be in athletics or sports or whatever, or movie star. Nothing wrong with those things. But if we really want to have power, you know, and play poweronomics, right? Like shout out to Claude Anderson, (laughs) right? We need to be doing these different things. And when we look at your firm, BKR, like what is the end goal you have in mind when you really close your eyes, you know what BKR, you know, we just started seven deals today. What does the end look like for you and your partner? Yeah. And no, I think it's to raise multiple funds. Um, not only raising multiple funds um, this year, we started a fellowship um, where we're, we're teaching individuals that have an interest in getting into the venture space, yeah. getting into the fund management space um, to get access mm-hmm to the the know-how on that industry. So we started our first um, fellowship. I think we had seven individuals. They're going through, I, I want to say, about six-month fellowship um, program um, led by BKR and a few ind- individuals and instructors that's teaching them on the venture space, teaching them on, on all the different levels of investments from the C to the Series A, teaching them on what to look at, teaching them about the cap table. So now what we're doing as we're creating our fund mm-hmm. We're also helping those that potentially could create their own fund, mm-hmm. right? So that we're now helping to create an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Because me as a as a general partner, when I look at a company, I want to be able to call you up or call somebody up and say, you know what, here's a company that I like. You know, let's both look at this and see if we could both invest in it. Mm-hmm. If there's more investors in the community, there'll be more successful businesses in the community to scale yeah. as well, too. Yeah. And I want to shift the conversation towards other things that DreamMaker does, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Property, management, uh, education, private equity, of course, brokerage. Um, And as well, too, when we're talking about property now, you know, you've built a hotel close to the airport. Correct. DreamMaker Suites. Yes, yes. Um, What uh, inspired this project? Yeah, Again, so it just comes back to, again, building infrastructure, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is our, our first of many um, boutique hotels that we're going to be launching um, in the GTA. Um, and the first one is an um, 18-room hotel that we're expanding it out to about 30 rooms. Um, it's a digital hotel. Um, it's, it's Dream Suites at YYZ, literally about four or five minutes from the from Pearson Airport. Um, but not only is it a hotel, but it, we have co-working space um, for entrepreneurs within our community, entrepreneurs that are taking our our program through Dream Legacy Foundation could tap into the co-working space. And then we have an event space that fits about 100 um, people. They could get access uh, to the um, event space as well. And and really, we're now creating a sort of what we're calling Dream Hub, a membership program yes. as well, too, where as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you tap into Dream Hub. And what do you get? You get access to co-working space. You get access to um, hotel space at a discount. You get access to an event space. You get access to the VC world. You get access to a foundation that has wraparound services from mentors to those that could connect you with corporations that you, depend on the industry that you're in. You get access to an environment yes. um, that, that is looking at the benefit of you succeeding. Mm-hmm. Um, and also we're creating a training center um, within the facility as well too, focusing on skill traits. Um and, and yeah, we're, it's, um, it's going to be one of many buildings that we're doing uh, and we're excited. Uh, we, we launched it right before COVID and we had to take a, a little bit of a break, but we're, we're thankful that it's now up and running yeah. uh, for the last 10 months. We've had several events there, you know, we've had 
events with FaZe, we've had events with BBPA, events with Ryan and, mm-hmm. and his organizations. We've had multiple events with tech founders um, there. Um, during Collision, we had about 20 um, tech founders from Nigeria that stayed there. Um, so we're, we're excited. We're, we're, we're creating a space that um, entrepreneurs um, could call their home. That's amazing. Uh, congrats to you, your team, your family. Thank you. That's big things. And you're only 39 right now, right? <laughs> You've done so much. Thank you. Uh, a lot of accomplishments, a lot more to accomplish. What keeps you going every single day? You know, I'm just like, where's that motor coming from? You know, like again, like I like I always say, when when you're when you're given things, much as much as given, much as expected, and you know, as God has opened up doors mm-hmm. for me and my family and the business in different industries in a short period of time, we don't take that for granted. You know, like you know, three four years ago, I wouldn't have thought that we'll get the opportunity to launch um, and co-launch the Knowledge Hub Research in partnership with Carleton University and multiple universities across Canada, focusing on what are the gaps for black entrepreneurs in Canada Mm -hmm. and start creating the data that will have a direct impact for black entrepreneurs, not just today, Mm -hmm. but for years and decades to come, Yes, right, through our foundation, right? So a small opportunity was given, and we we jumped on that opportunity, and we now expanded on that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So the driving force is just, you know, being able to, to really change the face, change industries, um, where we predominantly don't, where we predominantly see a lot of underrepresented communities, um, and and have an impact mm-hmm. while doing it. Do you feel pressure? It's always pressure. There's yeah. pressure. They so, say pressure makes diamonds. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you ain't if you ain't doing something of impact, um, um, then then you're not gonna have a lot of pressure. So we, for me, I love I love pressure. I love I love challenges. I love yeah. battles, and I love problem solving. Mm-hmm. And and I think over the last ten years we. We saw problems and issues within the real estate space that needed exposure within a community, and we did that. We were a part of solving that problem. We're now part of solving the tech and entrepreneurship problem. We're part of solving that infrastructure problem. We're part of now solving the data problem, and and because how could institutions help if they Mm -hmm. lack the data? Because here's the thing about institutions. If there's not enough representations within the institutions, then the only thing they could go by on is data, right? So if they lack data and they lack representation, they're going to lack solutions, Mm -hmm. right? So they're slowly bringing on more representations within the institutions. Mm -hmm. That's going to take time to get to a space where there's a real impact. But while that's happening, now we need data. Yes. Right. So now we're creating that data to tap that into the representation. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to start seeing some massive impact within the community. Yeah, it seems like you've got a lot on the go every <laughs> single day with all these different subsidiaries. And, you know, I'm curious what kind of calendar app you're using to manage your schedule. Because <laughs> I'm like, you got this, you got a family, and you got so much going on. And, you know, a lot of people, like, in the community see you as, like, a strong businessman doing a lot to really elevate everyone. But on a personal side, outside of the things you do for Dream, what other things interest you? Again, my, my daughters, obviously, my my wife and my family as a whole and, <clears throat> and doing whatever, you know, that, that interests them in terms of, you know, school activities and, you know, the promise I made to all three of them is every school trip I'll be there. Even if it's Terry Fox runs, I'll be at the Terry make, Fox run, making, yeah. making Terry Fox run. Um, you know, they've gotten a lot of interest in swimming, soccer, um, horse riding. So those are areas that they love. And mm-hmm. fortunately they love the Raptors as well too. So on Sundays where they're at the, the Raptors games, um, as well too so it's, it's it's been good they've been seeing the journey you know they've been exposed to it um, and you know the flexibility of what I'm doing allows me to create an environment that they'll be able to be part of mm-hmm. um, businesses they'll be able to part be part of and and options that they're going to be able to have yes. uh, when they when they get to adults mm-hmm. and as we head towards wrapping up you know we're here recording in December heading into 2023 yes. on a personal level Right. What's like one thing you're looking to accomplish this year? Going into 2023? Yeah. Yeah. You know, on a personal level, you know, just continue to live the dream. You know, I think continue to, to have an impact that makes my daughters and my wife and my family proud. And then to have an impact that, you know, allows me to benefit and also 
to to build on what's been given to me. Mm-hmm. You know, to when you look back at the story and say, okay, you know what? I was given all this opportunity, given an opportunity to help others, given an opportunity to help a generation, and and he did what he could to do that. Mm-hmm. And he collaborated so that it continues to last. Mm-hmm. Right? So so that's that's what you know I personally want to continue to do. Um, and as long as my daughters and my wife is happy in that, yeah. and they're involved in that, um, and they're they're growing in that, then I'll continue. To do that. Yeah, that's like every man's dream, right? To see their kids like happy to see their dad do well. You know, like I mean, that's my dad driving for us. Like, you know, I do this for you. You know, I brought you <laughs> this country to get education. Da 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 da. Right. So as I get older and as I'm approaching those years, I'm like, I can see why it means a lot. Yeah for us to see him as like this guy who's done a lot so uh kudos to you and uh lastly where can people find you isaac um you know dream suites at yyz at our hotel business hub um on instagram um dreammaker to um bkr capital dot ca um yeah amazing man well isaac thank you so much for joining us here on the sure. other canada podcast I'm your host, Owen Osinde, and uh, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one.